Hello and welcome back to the Culture Wave Media Network. Today we are covering the first episode, the highly anticipated adaptation of Uzumaki. As you can see, uh, Godzilla over here in the corner. <laughs> I brought my copy of the manga by Junji Ito. I am your host today, Vinny Albano, and I'm joined with Mark, Mark Acabino. What's up, Vinny? Happy Hello. to be back. Let's talk some anime yes yes so it is just the two of us today and very excited to talk about this because i i've read uh uzumaki about pretty recently actually only about a year or two ago i read uzumaki and it made a very bold impression and it's also one of the most famous works of manga in the world mm. uh, or of all time uh junji ito is just such a legend when it comes to the horror genre he's just i'm sure everyone watching this video knows that like he and his work is synonymous with just the genre as a whole uh but yeah let's just dive right into this uh mark what was your overall thoughts as someone who you've never read the manga i have never read the manga and i only knew about this show and the manga because of you and how highly you spoke of it so um i was looking forward to it just from your excitement hmm. uh and i was i was very happy with with this first episode it was unsettling in all the right ways the music was fantastic the animation it, it feels like the manga coming to life it's hmm. very beautiful in the way that it creates this 2d picture but it has so much depth and then we already talked about off camera the the rotoscoping that they did with some of the character animations so you can see a very fluid human-like movements which yeah, almost adds yeah. to the unsettling nature of the subject so i really like this first episode how about you yeah no i was pleasantly surprised as someone like i mentioned who, who read the manga this is one-to-one -one. this mm. is probably the closest a anime adaptation can ever get wow uh aside from we'll talk about the story structure because that which was something i kind of predicted that they would do because the manga is set up very episodically where one chapter is kind of one event and then it moves on to the next event mm. and moves on to the next event but uh i think due to the pacing of how a television show works they have started blending it so we see the, uh one event occur with uh i forget the character's name but the, the girl the classmate who famously uh with the spiraling mm. eye and she just sucks her body absorbs into itself uh but we also get the introduction of other subplots happening uh correspondingly like the uh i'm trying not to spoil the classmate mm -hmm. who is yep. just like <laughs> the bullied one uh and we see some other foreshadowing and subplots begin to start which is different from the manga where uh the manga like i said happens episodically where like it wasn't happening at the same time but rather one event would happen and the next event and the next event yeah and i was gonna ask you about this because i think some of the online discourse around this first episode from manga readers was that they didn't like this change that mm. they didn't like that they crammed so many different storylines into this first episode with like you said the the classmate who gets bullied we have one of the main characters his father is the main point of this episode and his obsession with the spiral and then of course the uh the girl the most famous image probably from this manga the girl with the spiral uh on her forehead so mm. how, you you enjoyed that how they did it here I did because as someone who like coming from a TV and a filmmaker perspective, it, it wouldn't have worked mm -hmm. the other way. Yeah. It's to these, unless you were doing like five, 10 minute episodes each, right. but that it just doesn't work like that, you know, because the industry is, it needs you. There's a minimum, you know, you have to, especially within the, the anime industry, there is a minimum of, of 20 minute episodes and due to that they had to make some sacrifices and had to kind of break the structure uh to fit within a television medium so mm -hmm. i think it's appropriate I don't, i'm not up in the air like <laughs> fist raised i think sometimes it can feel a little um almost like it's it, it can feel a little too much yeah uh, but for how good everything else is and like like i said this is the 
closest you can ever get to adapting the manga, mm-hmm. it far exceeds and makes that complaint a little one okay. rather than a big one, you know? Gotcha. Yeah, I just wanted to kind yeah. of get your perspective because you had read it. And, um, you know, as someone who didn't read it, I did feel like, oh, there's a lot going on in this first episode. And we're kind of thrust into it, you know, mm-hmm. within the first five minutes, we're already introduced to his father kind of going out of control um and i was just curious if that's kind of what the manga did and kind of just threw you into it yeah no it certainly does okay uh that's the first story that occurs within the manga yeah and right off the bat we're shown imagery of just how it is in the show okay um cool and just the only difference being that the other subplots are being introduced earlier rather than one after the other uh moving on though the, i, I want to talk about how this this show has been like in production for years. Like I I remember them saying how this was gonna come out, I believe, one or two years ago. And that was only just the release to imagine also the years of production mm-hmm. before that. Right. So we had it being pushed back, pushed back, and it's finally here. And I wanted to get your perspective on the matter of like coming from a, a, a technical perspective in the animation. I know you already talked about the rotoscoping yeah. and that it is, it, it's impressive. Mm-hmm. It is impressive. There's so much, there's so much nuance. There's so much detail. If you wanted to comment on that or. Yeah. I mean, like I said, it, it feels like the manga where, you know, you have your 2d animation, but there's so much like fluidity, even in the 2d, like the, uh, the spirals in the water, like everything obviously has spirals going on in the backgrounds. The backgrounds are like a painted kind of charcoal brush feeling to it. Um, and then the facial animations of the characters are just so detailed and you really need that because when you're in a horror genre, the reactions of the characters are so important and in live action it's obviously easier to get to get that but mm. with animation you really have to focus on it and i thought they did a, a really great job and and all of the you know unsettling imagery here with the father and um some of the stuff we see later like it it all hits the marks for me so i was i was impressed by the animation oh yeah uh so i wanted to, what was your what was your like scariest moment oh okay yeah no the, the, I, I was waiting for this question yeah. when his mom is in the hospital and she sees like everything spiraling as like an issue to get rid of and she starts cutting off her fingers because of the fingerprints yeah. i was like oh my god first of all i was like damn there are a lot of spirals in this world but then i was like that is just so dark hmm. in in its concept that you would literally be driven to the point where like oh my gosh i'm gonna literally mutilate my fingers off because there's spirals on them. yeah 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 so that would probably be my moment how about you yeah Ooh, it's hard to pick obviously iconic wise like when um what's her face uh was it yuki or no uh yeah i believe it was yuki the the, the classmate girl um girl with the crescent scar yeah yeah she obviously that's iconic that Mm -hmm. moment where it's revealed of that spiral right in that chunk of her face yeah but for me and and what was imagery that really stood out to me when i read the manga too and and same in this episode is when they find the father yeah just absolutely like contorted his body into a spiral in this bot in this uh made spiral box yeah. and that is so disgusting <laughs> in all the right ways and all the right great ways um that's probably my favorite moment of horror there was a point in that scene where they're checking the hallways and then they find the room hmm. and whenever i watch anything horror i always watch the backgrounds because i always think yeah. it's scariest when things are in the background that you can miss really easily it happens in uh, it the first it movie where they're in the library and hmm. the librarian like in the background gets closer and closer but it's never yeah. focused on and in this scene when they enter the room in the background of one of the pictures or i don't know if it's a window you see like a distorted spiral face Mm. and that really freaked me out and then obviously you see the father in the box but i always appreciate when horror puts those little things in the background to keep you on edge um so that i'm glad you mentioned that scene because that one also hit for me Mm, that is really interesting because that's something i did not pick up on 
Yeah, go, uh, but <laughs> go back and check it out, everyone. <laughs> I I will be checking it out because that's that. And that's also like I love I love horror as a genre, and that is also one of my favorite moments. I mean, I've talked about it so much on this podcast, but Hereditary, mm-hmm. like yeah. the use. Uh, have you seen Hereditary? No, it's on my it's on my list. I'm yeah. gonna get there. <laughs> okay, well, I'm not gonna spoil anything, but like the you even uh, Ari Aster's other film, Midsummer, very very different. I've seen that one, ironically. <laughs> okay, perfect. So like you know, in Midsummer, in the background, you have like the while everyone's tripping flowers are breathing and there's faces mm-hmm. in the mountain right uh, her hereditary uses shadows in a very similar way cool and that's such something i also adore within the genre um moving moving forward to the uh, honestly this is just it's just such a powerful piece of media i think i i I wanted to talk about how Junji Ito has been try. They've been trying to adapt his work, mm-hmm. and it's never really worked. I it's it's really difficult to mm-hmm. adapt. I think Junji Ito's work because the level of detail within his manga and just the certain notes that he hits. I think the reason why this works so well and props to the director hiroshima uh nagahama he brings a sense of direction where it is kind of kind of piggybacking off of that previous point that i was saying of how how one-to-one this is with the manga and why i think that works the black and white and the subtle details the subtle capture like you mentioned in the emotion and the faces Mm -hmm. And even what what stood out to me te- on a technical level was how certain manga elements were were here, mm-hmm. uh, which you typically don't see in an anime. Like for example, when the one uh, classmate, the the guy who's going to meet up with um, the crescent shaped uh, scar yeah. girl at the playground, and he turns around to look at her. And you have like this, this like expression. There's like an like, aura around people with like the spiral plague or something. Yeah, yeah, and that it, it's so literally pulling it straight from the pages of the manga. Mm-hmm. I and I think it works perfectly, especially setting this in fully black and white. Yeah, it just amplifies that tenfold. Yeah, yeah. So, what are what are some other works by like Junji Ito like that you know of, or what makes him so like special in this space? Because just as as someone coming to it from you know not having really much exposure to him, I always find it interesting when horror can find seemingly not scary things and then make them mm-hmm. very unsettling, like spirals. Obviously, yeah. you know you don't even think about spirals in your life, and then you see a show like this, and you're like. Oh yeah, that is kind of creepy, and I feel like Jordan Peele kind of does it as well, taking just seemingly not scary things and making them scary. Does he do that in more of his work, or is this kind of one that stands out from his other stuff? I think this stands out. I think it's a similar theme. Mm. Uh, this one, though, particularly, is his work of commenting on obsession. Okay, and and, and that's what I, I wanted to talk about it before. That's what I love so much about this is because I love. I mean, you hit it right on the head of the nail there. Like, it's, it's, uh, I love when horror takes, like you mentioned, something that is not Mm horror-ish, but particularly when horror takes something so little and it obsesses it and shows you the, the total, like darking i'm mean, ironically no pun intended <laughs> the darkening spy downward spiral right. that uh it takes you on mm-hmm. uh and just building upon a small concept like that i think that's uh i just found it fascinating mm-hmm. speaking of his other works uh so, have you heard of tomi it sounds familiar <laughs> yeah tomi tomi's another famous work of his um the one with the planet, uh, shit, I forget what it's called. Uh, he also did a manga adaptation of 
uh, Ozamu Desai is no longer human, mm. if you know of the that novel. And let me look up his work. Also, something that I find funny, um, he is renowned as one of like the greatest Japanese horror creators. And you also have someone, the internet has pointed this out so many times online. You have someone like Hayao Miyazaki from mm-hmm. Studio Ghibli. And Hayao Miyazaki creates all these really wonderful, like beautiful, cute worlds. Junji Ito is the opposite. Right. All his worlds are dark and depressing. And then in real life, you have Miyazaki, who's a very miserable old man. <laughs> and Junji Ito is so, like, very cutesy personality. Uh, I recommend you uh, look up and watch some of his interviews. I will. I yeah. definitely will. <laughs> he, loves, he loves cats. Mm-hmm. He's always talking about cats. There's entire interviews about how he... He's like rating uh, funny cat videos or mm-hmm. funny cat <laughs> cat stuff. Uh, some other stuff. He also did an adaptation of Frankenstein. I forgot about that one. Cool. Uh, Sensor. I'm trying to get the one with the. There's a really famous one about a an alien planet. Uh, I forget. I completely am forgetting the name of it. Yeah, I didn't uh, mean to put you on the spot, but um, no, no, you're no. Right. It is. It is interesting that you mentioned like the concept of obsession, and and now it's something I'm very excited to see where this story goes and what is the symbolism of the spiral and what is it commenting on in our world um and you know my first impression was like you know obviously like you said obsession the the new pretty girl at school everyone's trying to go out with her and then that kind of she because she's very egotistical and it you know that kind of ruins her life because she's so self-absolved and then she starts bringing other people down with her and then her father we don't know his backstory. Obviously, we might learn more. You know, maybe he had issues beforehand, and then that this literally spiraled into how he became obsessed with the spirals themselves. So, mm. I'm very interesting to see what the the social commentary of this story is moving forward. And uh, I'll definitely keep an eye out for obsession in, yeah. in this story. Yeah, it, it is like I mentioned a, a prevalent theme, and something that I just. I think this is just such a banger adaptation thus far. It is. I, yeah. I, honestly, if we want to address some of, of the, like you mentioned, discourse online, I will say like four episodes almost seems short, but we'll see how it plays out. Right. I mean, it's still too early to, to say, mm-hmm. uh, but it is so good thus far. I don't know if you had anything else to talk about, but no, no, I think, you know, you brought up criticism. I think the only criticism, if I could even grasp at something is that it may be relied a little bit too much on reaction shots in this Mm. first episode. Whereas I wish they maybe pulled that tension a bit more before, you know, showing a character's reaction. Like, Oh, okay. We're going to see something freaky. The camera cut to, which I wish it, it would maybe just happen more naturally where, you almost see it with the character or something like that, but yeah, um, yeah. that you know, I'm grasping at straws here. This was this was really just a great like 22 minute watch, and I can't wait to see what they go, what they do moving forward. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. I will be covering Uzumaki week to week, only four episodes, so join us for each episode. Uh, this is a banger, just <laughs> a banger, absolutely great. Uh, this has been us covering episode one of Uzumaki at the Culture Wave Media Network. All the if you like our content here, please check out the YouTube channel. We have so many other podcasts. We Mark and I, and sometimes Mikey, who wasn't able to join us today, but uh, we cover anime animation all the time on this channel, among other stuff, many other stuff. Mm-hmm. So check it out. Check out our other socials, our Instagram, and our threads, and our Facebooks, all down below. All content very similar and akin to this. This has been I, Vinny Albano. And I'm Mark Iacobino. So long. This is The Culture.